And uh, this morning, we're going to look at three passages. So we're going to be in three different places of the Bible. But the first one we're going to start with is going to be in Psalm 23. In Psalm 23, and this is a Psalm of David. A Psalm of David. And David wrote most of the Psalms. Uh, he did. And this is uh, King David that we are talking about here. And so in Psalm 27, uh, we're going to start in verse 1. And it says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall, shall I be afraid? When the wicked advanced against me to, de to devour me, it is, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though the army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though, we war, though war breaks out against me, even then will I be confident. One thing I ask the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of the Lord, and to seek Him in His temple. For in the day of trouble He will keep me safe in His dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of His sacred tent, and He will set me upon a rock. And I really love that psalm of David. And he goes on later in that psalm to say, you know, Lord, when you said, when you called me, when you told me to seek your face, my heart said, your face will I seek. And I just love that Psalm of David. But there in verse 4, he said that there is this one thing that I ask for. This one thing that I do, there's one thing that I desire, and he said, that will I seek after. And this morning, that's what I want to talk about is that one thing. That David said there is this one thing that I do. And that I desire. He says to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of his life, to gaze on the beauty of God, of the Lord, and to seek him in his temple. That was the one thing that David says, that that is the one thing that I desire, that I seek after, the one thing that I'm going to do. So I'm going to seek the Lord. I want to be with him. I want to dwell in his house and his temple. And in the Bible, when God talks about David, it is said that David was a man after God's own heart. And God says a lot of things about other people. He calls, you know, Abraham and some of these other people friends of God. Moses was a friend of God. But David, he said, was a man after God's own heart. And I would love, out of all the things that God says about people in the Bible, for that's what he says about me. That I am a man after God's own heart. I would love for God to say that about me. I'm sure all of us would like that, right? Yeah. To say that we are someone who is after God's own heart. I would love that. But David was a man after God's own heart. But when we look at the Bible, the one thing it really highlights about the life of David was his failures sometimes. Where he failed, his shortcomings. But God looked at David's heart and saw that he had a heart that was desiring of him. And so he looked past his failures and shortcomings because he knew his heart. God knew that David would mess up. And I'm so thankful that God can look past all of our failures and all of our mess ups and look at our heart. See if we're really desiring him or not. To see if our hearts are pleasing to him where God so honored David. A man after his own heart. God so honored David that he let his son, Jesus, be called the son of David. Jesus was called the son of God. He was also called the son of David. That's how honored God put David. He honored David that way to let his son be called the son of David. And so David says here he has this one thing, this one thing that I'm going to seek after. And David, who wrote most of the Psalms, the king of Israel, if he said that there is one thing that I do, a man after God's own heart says there's one thing that I do, it must be pretty important. If he has this one thing that he says that I will do. 
But there's other people in the Bible who also said that they had a one thing. Paul said that he had a one thing. So if you, if you want to turn to Philippians 3. In Philippians 3, 3 and verse 13. And listen to what the Apostle Paul says is his one thing. In Philippians 3, verse 13, he says, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do. One thing that I do. Forget, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. I press towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So David had a one thing. Paul had a one thing. Both of them were two pretty important people in the Bible. And they said that they have one thing that they do. Where David, a man after God's own heart, says, I do this one thing. Paul, who wrote half of the books of the New Testament, said, there is one thing that I do. So that one thing must be important. The one thing he said, he said, I'm forgetting what is behind, and I'm straining towards, I'm pressing ahead. And what was he pressing ahead towards? What was he going after? He says, to win, he says, to the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So what he's saying is saying, I'm letting go of the past, and I'm heading towards, I'm striving, I'm pressing, I'm going after Jesus. That's what Paul says, I'm striving towards Jesus. So he says, the one thing, I'm letting go, I'm pressing forward. I'm forgetting that which is behind me. <coughs> but a lot of times it seems like when people get saved, they get kind of stuck on the things behind them. They don't forget about those things sometimes. They get stuck back there, uh, you know, in the failures of yesterday. Where the devil or people or their own memory will keep bringing up what they did in their past. And they have truly repented. They've truly asked God to forgive them, but they still have these regrets that still keep coming to their mind of what they used to do, who they used to be. They keep coming back. And they can't move forward with God because they keep dwelling on all those things they did in their past. Instead of letting it go and pressing on towards God, they can't let it go sometimes. And if you have truly repented, then God doesn't want us to dwell on all those things we used to do. Because we're a new creation. We're a new being. We're new. He doesn't want us to dwell on those things in the past. We've got to put those behind us and keep moving forward. Because we've been forgiven of those things. And Paul says, he's forgetting what's behind, he's driving ahead. Paul has some stuff in his past. Paul did some stuff in, the, in his past where the Bible tells us that Paul was persecuting the church. He was trying to destroy the church of Jesus Christ. He's pursuing after them. It says that, you know, he was condoning, he was agreeing with them being put to death. That he was trying to destroy this church, destroy Christians, approving of those being put to death. And I wonder if Paul, after he'd been saved, if someone ever came up to him, you know, after he was preaching to all the people, if someone ever came up to him, and they didn't say, good preaching, Paul. They said, do you know that you have my husband put in prison? Do you know that you had my son put to death? Now, I couldn't imagine... Somebody coming up and telling me that after Paul has been completely changed and they keep bringing up that stuff in the past. And I'm sure that people did. I'm sure the enemy kept reminding him of how what he used to be, all the people he had hurt, all the things he did against the church of Jesus Christ. But Paul knew that he had been forgiven of all that. And so he says, I'm not dwelling on that. I can't change that. I'm forgetting that. It's behind me. I'm pressing towards Jesus. But sometimes it's uh, sometimes when we've been saved for a longer period of time, it's easy to put that stuff behind us. We know we've been forgiven. We know we've truly been forgiven, and God doesn't ever bring that up again. He's washed us in the blood of Jesus. He's you know cast it away. We're these new creations. He's he even says that I will remember your sins no more. So we know this, and that's good news for us to keep remembering. But when Paul said here, he said that I'm forgetting that which is behind and pressing forward. He didn't say I'm just forgetting all the bad stuff. 
He said, I'm forgetting what's behind. That means he's forgetting the good stuff too. Because sometimes there's stuff that is good in our life that we keep dwelling on and we can't get past it. We can't, keep, we can't move forward with God because we're still dwelling back there on the stuff of the past, even the good things. And what I mean by that is some people are still stuck on the high days from yesterday. Back, way back when on the high days. You know, it may even be where some people get stuck on, you know, the mountaintop of when they got saved and they can't ever get off that to keep moving forward with God. Because they're stuck back there on when they got saved. It's good that you got saved. And we should testify about that. It's good. We all, at one point, were lost and got saved and we should be praising God for that. For Him saving us. But some stuff should have happened between when she got saved to now. <coughs> You shouldn't just still be there. There should some stuff should have been happening since then. God should have done stuff in your life since then, since you've been saved. Something else that you can testify and praise Him about. Since you've been saved. But sometimes we get stuck back there on some high place and we can't move forward with God because we're still back there. Thinking about the good stuff. And I want to tell you that the same God who saved you who sanctified you, who put His Spirit in you, wants to do something today that was greater than yesterday. He always wants to move us forward to go deeper with Him. Can't get stuck back there. We've got to keep pressing forward towards Him. So that's what Paul says. He says, I'm pressing forward. I'm keeping moving forward with Jesus. Forgetting that's behind, moving forward. So David said, it's one thing that I do. Paul said, there's one thing that I do. And there's one other passage that said there was three. There's one other person that had a one thing. And that was Jesus. And if Jesus had a one thing, it must really be important. So I want you to listen to what Jesus said the one thing was. It's in Luke chapter 10. So if you want to, you can turn to Luke chapter 10. And so Jesus is at the house of Mary and Martha. He's at the house of Mary and Martha. And when he gets there, Martha is busy trying to get all this stuff prepared. Jesus is there, she's trying to prepare the meal, the food to eat, trying to prepare this food for them to eat, preparing all this stuff. And if Jesus showed up at our house, I am sure that each one of us would be busy trying to prepare something for Jesus. If He came, we'd be asking, right? We would be. We'd be like, what do you need? You need something to eat? You want something to drink? We do that with other people that come over. How much more with Jesus? Jesus showed up. You want something to eat? Do you need something? We'd be asking that stuff. That's what we do. But Martha was busy trying to fix and do all this stuff. And Mary, Martha's sister, was sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to Jesus teach. And pretty soon, Martha gets overwhelmed by trying to do everything and gets a little frustrated. And she comes out looking for Mary to help her. But when she does, she doesn't go to Mary and tell Mary to come help her. What she does is she goes to Jesus and she tells Jesus, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all this stuff? Tell her to help me. How many of us has ever done something like that? <laughs> my sister, anytime there was, she had something to do growing up. Anytime she did anything growing up. If I, she saw me not doing anything, because, you know, I'd already got what I was supposed to do done. <laughs> but anytime she was doing something, chore, whatever, she saw me not doing anything, she wouldn't come ask me to help her. She would go straight to my dad and tell him, tell Blake to help me. <laughs> That's exactly what she did. She did it yesterday. <laughs> okay. We went to my parents' house. My mom has her. We went over there yesterday. Mom told her, you know, hey, can you t cut that fan off for me? And the first thing she did was she went to Daddy and goes, Can you tell Blake to cut that fan off for her? Oh. <laughs> she still does it. <laughs> but how many of us hadn't done something like that before, though? Like, if we're honest, a lot of us are really like Martha, where you're working, you're doing something, and it's just like, tell them to help me. You know, at work, you could be working with people, and, you know, they're slacking off, they're not doing anything, you're over there working hard, and a little bit, you can probably get a little frustrated going, I'm having to pick up their slack now. How come they ain't helping me? And you might could go to your boss and go tell them to help me. 
We all do something like that. And so Martha was overwhelmed. And I do want to make sure that we understand that Mary, it doesn't mean that Mary never worked. Mary worked. Mary just understood that she needed to be listening at the feet of Jesus, but Mary did work too. But so, in verse 40 of Luke chapter 10, verse 40, I want you to listen to what Jesus says to Martha. So Martha comes, she says, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, indeed only one. There's one thing that's needed, there's one thing that is necessary. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. So Jesus said there are few things that are needed, indeed there's only one thing. What was that one thing, the one thing that was necessary? Jesus said that that one thing that is absolutely necessary was to sit at his feet and to hear his words. Because that's what Mary was doing, was sitting and listening at Jesus' feet. That is the one thing that Jesus said is necessary. And he tells Martha, you're troubled about all these different things. And I know today that there are many things that give us trouble in our life. We have many things going on. I mean, how many of us here today are not busy? We're all busy. We all got something to do. We have many, many things to do. We all are busy. But Jesus said there's one thing that is necessary, and that is to sit at his feet. He tells Martha, you're troubled about all these things, but Mary has chosen what is better, and it won't be taken away from her. And basically what Jesus said there was he said that Mary chose what was better and it won't be taken from her. Which means to sit at Jesus' feet, we have to choose that. In the midst of us being busy, in the midst of our mess, we have to choose to go and sit at his feet. And the good news is, is that we can choose it. We can choose to do that. And she chose what she chose to do was to sit at Jesus' feet instead of serving him, like Martha was doing. Instead of serving, she chose to sit at his feet. And that is interesting to me because sometimes we get so busy serving Jesus, doing all these good things, that we forget the one thing that is necessary, and that's to sit at his feet. It's good to do those things, but we can't neglect the one thing that is necessary that's to sit at his feet, to draw near to him, to be close to him, to hear his word. So there's three people, they all had a one thing. David had a one thing, Paul had a one thing, Jesus had a one thing. And guess what? They're all the same one thing. It's not three different one things, it's the same one thing. It's the same one. Remember what David said, he said, The one thing that I seek after, the one thing that I'm desiring, is to dwell in the house of the Lord, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. That's His one thing where David was basically saying, I am all about being with Him. I want to draw near to Him. I want to be with Him. I want to live in His house. I want to be at His temple. I want to seek Him. I'm sitting there. I'm seeking Him. Jesus is one thing that is necessary was to sit at His feet, to be with Him, to hear His word, to draw near to Him. And then Paul says, I forget what's behind and I press forward towards Jesus because what Paul was saying is that he desired to be with Jesus. Is about that relationship with Jesus was the one thing that was necessary. To seek after the Lord, to develop a relationship with Him. And I want to ask you that, what is that one thing in your life today? Because that one thing in our life is what drives us. We all have a one thing that we're chasing after, we're striving towards, we're going towards. We all have a one thing in our life that moves us. And Jesus said in Matthew 6 that no one can serve two masters. He says no one can serve two masters. You either hold to the one and reject the other, or you will love the one and hate the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And really, 
what he's saying there is you can't serve both God and anything else. It's not just money. You can't serve God and anything else. It's either you serve God or you serve this. It's the one thing. Nobody can serve two masters. And so we know that no one can serve two masters. And what Jesus is really getting at is that deep down in us, we're all after just the one thing. There's one thing that we're after. We can't serve two masters. We're all after one thing. We're chasing after one thing. So what is that one thing that drives you? And in most people's lives, that one thing is themselves. If we're honest, that one thing is really ourselves. Most people serve themselves. That's their one thing. Their whole life's about it. It's all about their comfort, their ease. It's all about what they can get. It's all about them. That's the one thing that they're after. Even when they come to church sometimes, it's still about them. That's the one thing that most people are after is them. I want to, you know, make money for me. I want to do this for me. All this stuff. Me, me, me. Most people's one thing are them. But it says, Jesus said you can't serve both God and money. You can't serve both yourself and Jesus. You just can't do it. Because if you try to serve both you and Jesus, like Jesus said there, you're either going to love one, hate the other, hold to one, reject the other. And what that means is if you try to serve yourself and Jesus, you're going to want to do this, but Jesus is going to want to do something different. Like you might want this job, but Jesus wants you to take the other job. You might want to buy this, and Jesus might want you to give that money away to somebody. You might want to make more money, and Jesus might want you to make less money. And in those types, then we really find out what our one thing is, who we really going after. Is it him, or is it us? Who are we really serving? Are you serving you or Jesus? And in America... We kind of try to mix the two and make it the same thing sometimes. Where we say things like, this is what I want to do, so that must mean that's what Jesus wants me to do. Whenever we didn't pray about it, we didn't read the Bible, we didn't pray to think about it at all. We just like, that's what I want to do, so Jesus must be okay with what I want to do. Instead of really serving and chasing after him, it's more of, well, what's best for me? What can I get out of it? So what is that one thing that we are really try striving and searching after. And when I ask you a question, what did Jesus save you for? Most people's response to that is to take me to heaven. That's most people's response. He saved me to take me to heaven. So I could be with him. And that's right, but what is that all about? Because the reason that he saves us was because sin was in the way of us relating to Him. Sin was in the way. When Adam and Eve sinned, they, when Adam and Eve sinned, they were separated from God. We had been separated from God because of sin. Sin was in the way, and that sin had to be removed so we could relate to Him, so we could be with Him. It's impossible for you and I, as sinners, to relate to God, to walk with God, a holy God, until sin is taken out of the way. Until sin is taken out of the way. So he sent Jesus to die on the cross to shed his blood so that the sin could be removed, could be taken away, so that we could relate with him. To relate to a holy God, but in that relating it's a relationship with him. Because sin is now taken out of the way. And the reason that he wants us with him in heaven is so that we can be with Him in that relationship, that fellowship with Him, where we get rid of these sin-cursed bodies that we have, and we have in, uninterrupted fellowship with Him and communion with Him, a relationship with Him, and that's what heaven is all about. It's all about Him. It's not about, I'm going to get there and I'm going to do all this stuff. It's always about Him when we get there. And so that one thing that we should be doing here striving towards Him and seeking after that relationship with Him. Because that's what the one thing boils down to. To seek Him, to have a relationship with Him is sitting at His feet. It's chasing after Him. When you have a relationship, it's not about do's and don'ts. It's always been about a relationship. And the only way we can have a relationship with Him is through intimacy. When you have intimacy with someone, it's this communication, you're with them, you're around them, you have this intimacy, this connection with them. 
And you can never build a relationship if you don't have that communication and you'll never have that level of intimacy with someone unless you are around them and spend time with them. Me and Victoria have a level of intimacy that we have developed over years of being with each other and years of her putting up with me. We've developed it over these years where I know what she's thinking sometimes without her having to tell me because I know her. We have that connection. Where this Friday night we were eating with a couple and they were saying something. I looked at Victoria. I looked at Victoria. She looked at me and I went like this. Because I knew what she was about to say. And I went, don't say that. <laughs> but I know her and she does the same to me sometimes. I'll be up here preaching. She's like, don't say that. <laughs> But we know each other. There's an intimacy there. We can relate to one another. There's a relationship there. There's a relationship with one another there. And that comes through the intimacy, the connection, the being around with one another, the sitting, the talking with one another. It's a relationship of these shared moments. And that type of intimacy, in any type of relationship we have, we have to have some type of intimacy in that way for it to grow. So basically, you can't grow in your relationship with anyone unless you have intimacy. I can't grow with Victoria unless we have intimacy. There's some shared time together. I can't grow with any of you in our relationship with any t unless we have some type of intimacy, some type of getting together. And it's the same with the Lord. You cannot grow in the Lord unless you get time with Him and spend time with Him. So David and Paul were talking about this. And with Paul, right before in Philippians where he talks about <clears throat> um, that I'm pressing towards him, right before that he says, I want to know him. I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of the resurrection, but I also want to know the fellowship with him in his suffering, where Paul had a deep desire to know Christ. And that word know is... It's this idea that you know someone. There's an intimacy there where you know them. You know them. In Matthew, Jesus, uh, Jesus says, Many will come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not cast out demons? Did we not cast out devils in your name? Did we not prophesy? Did we not preach in, we, in your name? Did we not do all these many wonderful works in your name? And Jesus will tell them, Depart from me. I never knew you. That knowing, that knew someone is you know them. There's a connection there. There's an intimacy there. And that passage used to give me trouble because, you know, the Bible says you can't cast out, you know, demons or devils without the Spirit of God. So that means at one time, they had the Spirit of God to be able to cast out those demons. And they were also preaching in His name. They did all these wonderful things. And sometimes I wonder if people will get up there and say, well, I went to church. I tithe. I did all this stuff. But the point of it is that it's about did you know him? The very word know is about intimacy. So he's telling them that your life was all about this stuff, the casting out the demons, the preaching. It was all about this stuff. But you never spent time with me. You never knew me. You never had a relationship with him. It's all about the stuff. And that relationship is never going to grow unless you spend time with Him. It's about knowing Him. That's the main point of prayer. It's not about asking Him for all this stuff. It's about knowing Him. When we read our Bible, it's about knowing Him. The relationship between Him. And the only way you're going to have that relationship is you have to invest time in it. You have to invest time for a relationship to grow. That's not, not something new. Everybody knows that. Unless you don't, if you don't invest time, your relationship will not grow. So that means with me and Victoria, we have to invest time or our relationship ain't going to grow. With any of you, if there's no time invested, our relationship won't grow. With the Lord, if there's no time invested there, our relationship with Him will not grow. And I feel like that is a very big issue that the church has, is that investment of time in the Lord. Because we invest time in everything else. 
We invest time into watching TV, into being on our phones, social media, Facebook. We invest time in all this stuff we want to do. But where is the time that is invested in being and sitting at his feet? The one thing that he said was necessary. Where is that time investment going? And it doesn't matter who it is. If that relationship will not grow without that time invested in it. And if there is no time invested in it, then the relationship will grow cold and distant. Your relationship will grow cold and distant with the Lord. You won't be on fire. You won't be where you need to be. And it takes time to do that. You have to put in the time with Him to do that. And that means you have to shut everything down sometimes to be with Him. But also when you're doing that, you're investing time with Him. You're having that relationship with Him. You're also, when you invest that time, you're becoming like Him. Because you're with Him. We're supposed to be Christ-like. We're becoming like Him when we invest that time in Him. And my dad, when people who know me meet my dad, they know that he's my dad. That that is my father. And a lot of people know it instantly. Like when he just walks in there like, yeah, that's, that's your dad. <laughs> People know that. And it's not just that we look similar, but we do look similar. I don't have as much gray in my beard as he does, though. But we look similar, but it's not just that. It's we act alike, too. Where my grandma, many times, will say, you act just like your dad. When I was growing up, she would tell me, you are just like your father. That's what she would tell me. I would do something and she would go, that's exactly what your dad did when he was your age. And some of it, I'm sure, is genetics and came from birth, but most of it came from me spending the first 20 years of my life in his home. Where for 20 years, I was with him day and night. I was with him. I was sitting with him, talking with him, listening to him, listening to him talk to other people. I saw how he acted. I saw how he did things. And I picked up on it to the point where we have the same hand gestures to certain things. We talk the same. We have, in a way, the same kind of way of thinking about certain things. And that all came from the time that he invested in me when I was little about these things. Where we have the same hand gestures, we think the same, we act the same, we do the same things. So it's his fault that I'm this way. So if you're mad at me, get mad at him. It's his fault I'm like this. Where it's even to the point that we explain things the same way. And I didn't really notice it until my mom just had surgery. We both heard the doctor say something. We told people, and it was the exact same explanation that we gave to other people. Like almost word for word. Where I told Victoria, you know, what the doctor said. And then she called my mom. And then my dad, for some reason, explained to her what, uh, what was said. Well, pretty much exactly what I said, wasn't it? <laughs> and Victoria thought it was funny that I act so much like him. <laughs> that we even explain things the same sometimes. Sometimes. And the crazy thing is, is that I can tell you that if you talk to me, I can tell you right now where he stands on every single subject. Because I know him. I can tell you that because I know him. I know him. That's why I can do those things. That's why I don't even have to ask him about certain things. I know what, I know what his response is going to be. Because I know him. Because he spent that time with me. I sat with him and talked with him. And it's the same way it has to be with the Lord. Is that we got to know him in that type of way. That type of intimacy where in that we're becoming more like him. He's our heavenly father. We're supposed to be more Christ-like. The more time we spend with him, the more time we become like him. And become more Christ-like. Where we should be walking with the Lord in such a way that we know where he stands on everything. We should walk with him in such a way where we know where the Lord stands about certain things. Where we don't have to come and run to the Bible every five minutes because we know him. We know where he stands on these things. Because we're walking with him. We have that time investment there. 
And to do that, we have to shut down everything around us and spend that time with Him in prayer and the Word. And I know we can pray in all types of different situations. Like, I can pray at work as I'm moving the boxes. You can pray at your work. We can pray driving down the road. That's good. But we still have to have the time where we shut everything down and we pray with Him. Because what kind of relationship is it with Him if we only talk to Him while we're doing other stuff? It's not a relationship with Him. We've got to shut it down. Everything down. And spend time with Him. So that means we're reading His Word... And he's going to see us reading his word. And we're reading his word saying, we want to know you. I come here to know you. We're praying. We're praising him in all these things. The Bible says that he inhabits the praise of his people. But we also go, we also meet the needs of other people around us. We should be doing that, of meeting needs of other people. And, you know, the Bible says that whatever you did for the least of these, you did for me. So what he's saying there is he's saying when you meet the need of someone who is hurting, then you are also meeting the need. It's like you're meeting the need of Jesus, like if you're doing it to Jesus. You're doing it unto Jesus. And in that, it's also part of, that's part of seeking him. Because we want his heart, he would want me to do that. So we're seeking him, we're praising him. Getting together with other believers too is part of seeking after him. It might not seem like it, but that's part of seeking Him too because when we're around other believers, we're seeking Him. And the problem is that sometimes we get together, we do it wrongly. Like with church. Sometimes we come to church and church feels empty and we're not getting much out of it. And the reason is, is because we have come wrongly to church. It's not the sin. It's not the kind of music, it's not the hymns, it's not the people, it's not the preacher, it's you. That's just what it is. It is us. We came wrongly. If we came rightly, we would get something out of it. If we're not getting anything, it's because of us. Because when we come here, we come and we're gathering around other believers and we are worshiping the Lord. We are worshiping the Lord. We're hearing, you know, the message preached. We're hearing the Word of God but when we come, we should also be coming to try to encourage other people here. We all go through all kinds of stuff, and we need to be an encouragement to other people in here. We should come in here and seeking to look for somebody to encourage. Anybody agree with that? Is that wrong? Okay. Looking a little dead sometimes. But we come to encourage other people in the Sunday school, in the worship. It's about encouraging other people. If we would come in here to truly worship Him with other believers, we come here hungry to hear His Word, to hear His Word read, and to encourage other people, I promise you we will get fed every single time we come in here. We will get filled because God is going to see that we are seeking Him, trying to meet people's needs. We're trying to know Him. But are we seeking the Lord? What is that one thing that we're after? There's one more thing I want to mention before we close. And that is that there's one more time in the Bible where Jesus mentions that kind of phrase, one thing. That there was one thing. And that was when he was talking to the rich young ruler. Where this man comes to Jesus and he asks him, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus told him, you know the commandments. And he listed him some of the commandments. And he said, all this I've done since I was a child, since I was a young boy, since I was little. I've kept all these commandments. What, must, what else do I still lack? And Jesus says, there is one thing that you lack. Jesus had just listed him some of the commandments, and he said, I've kept all these commandments. And Jesus didn't tell him, no you haven't, you didn't keep the commandments. Jesus didn't tell him that. He said, there's one thing you lack. And that one thing he lacked, he said, go and sell your possessions, give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and then come and follow me. And it says that he went away sad because he had great possessions. And that man's problem was not that he had possessions and he had a lot of money. That wasn't the problem. 
It wasn't that, it wasn't the possessions and the money was the problem. The problem was that the possessions had him, the money had him. Where in his heart, it was all about the money. His pursuit was after the money, after the stuff. It was about the pursuit of the possession and stuff. And Jesus was saying, the one thing that you lack is because I don't have your heart. It's your heart. I don't have your heart. You're chasing after all these things, pursuing after all these things. And I don't have your heart. Money's not bad. Possessions aren't bad. It's bad when they start taking over us. <coughs> That's when it becomes bad. Or we're pursuing after that instead of chasing after Jesus. Or our life becomes pursuing after what we want, our desires, our making money, having all this stuff. And we stop pursuing after Jesus. We, started, we stopped investing that time. And it's just where is your heart at? Is it after Him or is it after all these other things? What's the one thing in your life? What is that one thing that you are chasing after, that you're pursuing after? What is the one thing? We all have a one thing, but is it really seeking after Him? And I can tell you that if your one thing is pursuing after Him, then you will have a time where you shut everything down, you get in the Bible and read it, you pray, and you invest time in Him. You're investing time, building that relationship to know Him. It's about knowing Him. And if we're not investing that time, then our priorities are wrong for one, but also that means He might not have our heart. We might know about Him, but not know Him. What is the one thing that we're after? And so let's pray this morning. Precious Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so thankful for Your Word. We're so thankful for everything that you have done for us. Lord, we thank you for your grace and your mercy, where we are so thankful that you sent your Son to come. We're so thankful that you came down to us to take away all of those sins, so that we could be with you, that we could know you. Lord, I pray that we would invest time in that relationship with you, that we would have that intimacy there where we would know you to a point where we start becoming like you. We want to be Christ-like, so Lord, give us your heart. Help us to chase after you and chase after your heart. Lord, in the Sunday school lesson, you said that you would remove the heart of stone. Give us a heart of flesh. So Lord, I pray you would give us that. Remove our hearts of stone soften our hearts, give us those hearts of flesh where we want this one thing and that's to desire and pursue and chase after you. Lord, help us, then help that to be this one thing in our lives. Where no matter what comes, we're just chasing after you. Lord, whatever you want, we're following you. You are Lord, we are the servants. We do what you want, not what we want. We're going to pursue and chase after you. Help us to have those investments, that time investments in you. We make time for it. It's the one thing that is necessary to sit at your feet and hear your word. To be with you, to dwell with you. So Lord, I pray this would, Lord, I pray this would grip all of our hearts. Help us to make those times. Help us to know you. And we can only know you if we invest that time in you. Help our relationship not to grow cold and distant because we haven't invested the time. And if we haven't been investing the time, Lord, help us today, right now, to start investing the time. So, Lord, whatever is keeping us from investing time with you, I pray that we would just, we would understand you, would help us to see it, help us to remove it so we can spend that time with you. And so, Lord, we pray all these things today in Jesus' name. Amen.